Who wouldn't want to know the safe zones and a catastrophe ahead of time? Once you get past that luck element that we mentioned in the last special episode, the second hurdle of survival is about your safe zone. Have you chosen well? Have you arrived at your destination and disposition? We can't do the entire planet, but you can apply key principles heard here to your location. And the location itself, apart from that luck element, is based mostly on three things, water, elevation to escape the great waves, and shelter, whether that's a forest or a cave. With the underlying notion that downtown anywhere is a wrong choice because being away from thousands of hungry people is always a good idea in a catastrophe, we will start with the water and jump back to episode 17 of the Catastrophe Cycle series. The recently famous Grasshopper Geography site is not only splendor and science combined, but Robert delivers to us an excellent watershed colored map with many different regions, individual countries plotted in eye-popping color. But beyond the beauty, you can glean useful information about that situational awareness for you in those waterways using the blue sector here in Central Africa. While lightning fingers outward, water drains to the broader lines and then into the sea. There will always be more water in the low-lying areas where it runs down and collects, but the water that falls at the top of the mountain is the cleanest there is, albeit much less of it. The site has tremendous state close-ups as well to help. It also has forest maps, which are places with potential animals, plant food, shelter materials, and more. And that is a nice little transition from a water lesson everyone should understand to the obvious question of elevation and in the context of the Great Wave. While in theory, an earthquake could send a tsunami in any direction, or your crustal region could shift and turn, in general, the oceans are where they are, and they aren't tied to the surface. The evidence says they'll invade the land in the disaster, and in that case, they are most likely going to be moving in the direction of Earth's current rotation, from left to right in all of these images we'll see here. In a previous special video this month, we went over the new Valley of the Sun, which is centered in Albuquerque and Santa Fe, running north through Colorado Springs nearly to Denver and south past the Sierra Diablo Mountains, where Jeff Bezos is hollowing out one of them right next to his suborbital launch facility, and then down into Mexico. It is my number one spot to live in the Americas. The Rockies provide the shield against the Pacific. I'm no fan of the West Coast for obvious reasons, or the middle of the Rockies. The weather will get brutal there, and there will be nowhere and no way to go. Towards the east, there's clearly evidence that not everything died in the last event, and the Ozarks and Appalachians do provide us our best chance there. By Alabama, Tennessee, Ohio, everything is trying to drain south towards the Gulf of Mexico, so that is an added bonus there if the great waves make it past the Rockies. And for the Atlantic Ocean sloshing back, which we must remember is definitively a thing too, the Appalachians should be able to withstand that second surge. There really isn't much good news for Europe, especially when we get to the weather, but that's the next episode. The highest mountains and the freshest water are my simple best bet answer if the great wave comes, knocking out two of those birds with one stone. It is a good moment to mention that the eastern part of a range is best here with the waves moving, well, from left to right as you see them, as it provides the height and runoff possibilities. So you're looking at eastern Spain eastern Turkey, northern Greece as opposed to the western range. Now an interesting thing to note is that the waves should be smaller the higher in latitude you go, which again comes with weather problems but one thing at a time. The UK provides us an example of that high latitude region where say the wave isn't high enough to crash over the entire island, best place to survive looks like it's going to be southeastern Wales. Let's say the wave doesn't make it over that range and the sloshback doesn't either. London, you're still in the drainage zone. Imagine the River Thames, 100, 200, 300 feet higher for three days, moving at 100 miles an hour. This is a very different water problem than might be expected in Phoenix, for example. Australia is up next, and it provides a fair play for a good bit of the country, even if the people are not really spread out over a good bit of the country. Let's start with the heights of the southeastern range, and what can I say? This is the peak of the nation, 
This is on the eastern side of the country, check mark there, and would actually be dealing more with the sloshback of the Pacific, which shouldn't be discounted once again. And since you are on the southeast side, the high latitude wave would be lower than the one that's heading over the northern reach of the country. And the shift of water away from the east coast as everything will be going left to right, west to east, provides a drainage region for the wave coming at you. Now it should also be noted that as the wave tries to get over the elevated central territory, it will have to not only continue marching uphill, but will be fighting the drainage pathways it has in literally every other direction away from those red central peaks. I have mentioned before, and I'll briefly mention again, that the narrowness of Central America means you better hope for a slow rise and access to a boat. And so that brings us to the Andes. Either it can withstand the Pacific or it can't. And while higher than much of the Rockies, it is a slice of a slice as wide. The far eastern range of Brazil, not sure it could even handle the slosh back of the Atlantic. But if the Andes do stop the Pacific, the mountains will push the slosh back into the mouth of the Amazon to the north and then also towards the south, making the central peaks actually another fair play and without the climate trouble you have in Europe, but for the case of a 90 degree flip or so, but again, that's another story, one thing at a time. And we're on to the southern part of the continent, and I can sum it up this way. Your peaks do get rain, unlike the Atacama Desert. The eastern rundown from the mountains honestly terrifies me because the Pacific can and likely will break through the valleys and slosh back down that slide into the Atlantic. And speaking of the Atlantic, it has nothing in its way during the slosh back. Probably will sneak back through the valleys and make it into the Pacific. Tree heavy mountains, hopefully ones with caves. That's what you're looking for there. And now we are on to Africa. Oh, Africa. While Chan Thomas has kind prophecies for you, my crystal ball is somewhat less clear. Cloudy, actually, with lots of water. Unless this land rises, there is not a ton stopping the Atlantic from racing all the way up to the eastern mountain ranges, where to the south, the range is wider, but we'll be taking the wave from both the west and the north as the funneling of the great wave against the northwest elevations will already be pushing that water southward. We are looking at the white and blue colors down in the southeast region again. Hope you've got caverns there as well. Preferably ones older than 12,000 years old, by the way. It's a good sign they can take a giant wave. And that's something I hope everybody was listening to. You guys are getting the picture. If your brain has already processed all the info nuggets in here, you might understand why I say the Eastern Himalaya are a good option. And indeed, the place I deem best on Earth is actually in Mongolia. But that is just on the geography alone, the expected catastrophe effects alone, and not considering the fact that I'm not moving to Mongolia. I mentioned shelter, and indeed, that could be a forest or those caverns that have withstood time already. We will come back to a last note on that underground bit after a little bit more on another kind of safe zone, a psychological one. The psychological prepping. This event would be so alien that the shock of it could functionally cripple many people, but that doesn't have to be you. Every morning we tell you at the end of the show, eyes open, no fear. Well, what does that mean to you? Things can be scary, but informed awareness of them is different than cowering from them or ignoring them. It is through the process of simulated experience that the armies of the world are trained and it is different from the physical training performed and it is also different than what you might call meditation. Simulated experience or mental practice is the active, conscious driven journey through what you might see or experience such that you are not a deer in the headlights and that your brain knows how to click into gear when the time comes. There is more scientific precedent for this than you might realize. Scientific studies have demonstrated the merit for musicians who essentially read their music, miming the motions without actually playing. It has been proven without the physical arm movement as well. The same works for sports, where a group of mental free throw practicers were shown to have matched the improvement of those who actually took practice free throws 
and for groups of runners who devoted the time to mental long-distance running, who matched the times and improvement of those who actually got out and ran. There is an application of this principle to what many of you call prepping. It is a readiness measure taken in anticipation of an unfavorable outcome or outcomes with various likelihoods over various timelines. Food, water, batteries, defensive tools, seeds, clothes, fire starters, the list is thousands long. But the principle must also apply to your mind. This event would be extreme. You can survive it. But the shock and awe to the circuitry inside is real. If you've ever seen someone in legitimate shock, you know that. That cannot be you if your children are depending on you. This fortress must be ready. A key aspect of mental practice is informational. Situational awareness is key and, as example, I'll use New Mexico, where I live. Good to know where the waterways are, especially in a desert. Even a small stream nearby can be a bounty. If you know about local elevation, that helps too, especially in relation to ocean proximity, snow caps, or other temperature change between peak and canyon at the same latitude. Other sites to know, and everyone knows Carlsbad Caverns around here, so maybe some others might make your list. Certainly the mining operation maps of your local area could be good in case you need to flee cosmic plasma or into the warmer rock of the crust. And for the same reason, the cavern systems of your area are good things to know as well. It is critical that you apply these basic principles to your own situation, for your own awareness, to mitigate the system shock of the event. There is no real way to prepare for what terrified our ancestors, what glazed the moon, and which may happen again. But you simply don't have time to think about these things at that moment. It is as important to understand them now as it is to stock food, water, and seeds.